All right. So last time what we did was we took these polar coordinates that we were working with and we tried to find uh, areas uh, using integration. So for some of these closed shapes, we found the area enclosed within the particular shape. And then for certain open-ended shapes, we found uh, the area as it's drawn out from one theta value to another. Now what we're going to do today is we're going to continue along the same vein, but this time we're going to look at area, areas between polar curves. Now with areas between normal rectangular curves, all you had to do for those is just take the, the bigger function and subtract off the smaller function. And then, so you essentially just did uh, two different integrals, really just one integral so you can combine them together. But unfortunately with polar curves, it's a bit more complicated uh, to do this for some of them. So let's, let's take a look at this. So before we go anywhere though, let's remind ourselves what the area formula is. So the area um, of a polar curve between angles A and B is going to be R squared D theta. And it's easy to forget about two things. It's easy to forget about this one half in the front. Don't forget we have that by the side. And then also don't forget to square R. It's not just the integral of R, it's the integral of R squared. And you also may see this written as F of theta squared if R is a function of theta. Now the first problem we're going to look at is, let's say we have two circles. R is cosine of theta and R is sine of theta. Now I can't emphasize this enough. When you're doing problems where you're looking for areas between curves, I strongly encourage you to draw out what the curves look like, because then that way you'll know which theta values you need to use for your bounds. So for example, this cosine curve here, that's the circle of diameter one, whose left side just touches the origin there, and it goes out one in the x direction, and then r equals sine of theta, that's kind of the same thing, except it goes one in the y direction, which is the same size circle. And what we wanna do for this is we wanna find the area of intersection. And that means the area that's included within both of the circles. And so if we look closely at this graph, we'll see that the area that's included in those circles is this little part in the middle right here. So we need to figure out how big that area is. Now, what I'm about to explain is going to be the method that we're going to use for all of these area in between curve problems, no matter how they're set up. So whenever you're doing one of these problems, you need to figure out your bounds. Uh, try to think of them in terms of this. So the way we do areas is we start at the origin and then we draw lines out to the boundary of our region. I'm drawing these lines as I go through the angle. And what curve am I touching? Well, I'm touching this circle, which is R equals sine of theta. So it looks like I'm going along just normally uh, with R equals sine of theta for the first part of this. Then I get to the place where these curves intersect. So how do I know what angle that is? Well, we often just set the curves equal to each other and see what angle we get. So we have cosine of theta and sine of theta, and we're in the first quadrant, so the angle that's gonna happen at is a pi over four. So it looks like at a pi over four, these curves intersect. And then if we were to keep following the shape that we want, notice how we just switch curves, and we start using this circle, or the cosine curve afterwards. And then we get all the way down there, and then we have all the area inside our shape. So when all is said and done, what will our integrals be? Well, the first integral we have is the integral from one half, uh, zero to pi over four, where they intersect, and the function we were following was sine. We have sine squared. Theta can be squared. Then what we did once we got that area, we also got the area from pi over four to pi over two uh, by following the cosine curve. So it may seem weird, but we're actually going to add that in. One half the area of pi over four to pi over two of cosine squared of theta. And if we did this, we would get the total area of this little pedal looking thing or the intersection between these two circles. Now, this is one way of doing it. And then to integrate both of these, we would use the half angle formulas and then integrate cosine of two theta. So this would be one half. Let me draw it up here. One half minus one half cosine of two theta. And then that would be the same thing, but with plus. Now, there's actually an easier way to do this. Notice that by using symmetry, we could just figure out the area for one of these and then double it because it's going to be 
it's clear by the picture they're going to be the same on either side. So rather than doing these two separate integrals, we could save time with symmetry by just doing the first one twice. So we could have a is 2 times 1 half the integral 0 to pi over 4 of sine squared of theta d theta. So now we could just do that one instead and then save ourselves half the work. So once again, symmetry helps us uh, save a lot of work when we're doing these area problems. All right, well, I'll leave it to you guys to figure out what this number actually is. So you should get some practice integrating um, sine squared and cosine squared because those happen all the time. All right, let's take a look at another example. And this one will be a bit different from the one we just did. Let's say I want to find the area inside the curve r equals 1. So we're looking inside the curve r equals 1, which is a circle. And but we also want to be outside the curve r is 1 plus cosine of theta. And if you've seen my lectures before, this is a familiar curve. This is going to be uh, the cardioid. So let's draw this. That should be our first step for any of these problems. So first I'm going to draw the cardioid. So the cardioid starts out here at 2. It comes here to 1 at pi over 2. And then once we get to pi, it's 0. And then conveniently, we have the symmetric shape on the bottom. So we end up getting something that looks like this, like a puffed out heart. And then r equals 1. This is a circle of radius 1 centered as the origin. That's what constant functions are uh, with polar coordinates. So a circle of radius 1 will look like this. There we go. All right, so what area do we want? Well, we want the area that is outside of this, but inside the circle. That means we're going to want uh, this area right here. We kind of shaded it and almost sort of looks like uh, one of those moon figures with a little pointy nose right here. That's, that's the area that we want to find for this. Now, what are we going to do? Well, first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the area inside this quarter circle. And by the way, if I just find the area of this top part, by symmetry, I can end up as doubling that and getting the whole thing because both of these functions are even functions. So they're symmetric about the x-axis. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to find the area of the top part. Now, if I kind of blow this picture up a bit, up here I have my quarter circle, and then I also have this little piece that's cut out of it right here. Now, if I begin by just doing the circle part, so that will go from pi over 2 uh, to pi, because pi over 2 is here, pi is there, I'll accidentally get too much area. Because if we use the same interpretation we used last time, we're drawing out from the origin to whatever curve we're integrating. You see that we accidentally pass over um, this curve right here. So what we need to do is we need to subtract off this area, because we accidentally counted it when we didn't want to. And how do we get that area? Let me show you with a different color here. Uh, that area we get by just following uh, the cardioid curve. So we subtract off that black part, and then we have exactly what we want. So in addition to having this, which is 1 squared d theta, we also need to subtract off the integral from pi over 2 to pi of the cardioid. So 1 plus cosine squared of theta. Oops, the square is here, d theta. And then since we were using symmetry here, uh, we're just going to multiply all this stuff by 2. So we get the whole thing. All right, so this is how we do it uh, in this case. So we accidentally went over this part. and We didn't want to, so we subtracted it off by following the other curve. Now, this integral is pretty similar to the other ones. If I were to start doing this, um, first of all, you can combine them into one integral because they have the same bounds right here. So I have 1 squared, which is, well, 1. These twos cancel with the, the one halves there. And then I have minus one plus two cosine of theta plus cosine squared of theta if I foil that out. So these ones will cancel out. And then we could just use the half angle formula to do that last cosine squared integral. So we would use uh, one half plus one half cosine of theta. So again, I'll leave this one for you guys to practice, but it's very similar to all the integrals we've been doing in the session. All right, so that's finding area between curves. And we're, well, don't worry if this seems a little strange. We're going to get a lot of practice with this um, 
in the ne over the next two classes. Now, one more thing that we're going to do with polar coordinates is something that we also did with parametric equations, where we found the, the arc length of a particular curve. So we're going to do that with uh, polar coordinates as well. And the formula, it looks like kind of similar to the parametric one, but it's a little bit different. So we have our integral from a to b. We have a square root, just like we did in the parametric. We have b theta over here. But this time, it's going to be r squared plus dr d theta squared inside the square root. You might be wondering, where does this come from? Well, if we look at x as r of theta times cosine theta and y as r of theta times sine of theta, then what we could do is we could use the parametric equation arc length one. So we had dx d theta squared plus dy d theta squared. We could use uh, the product rule with these. And then once we foiled it all out, it would simplify down to this. So that's where it comes from. Those calculations are a little bit tedious, though, and they kind of take a long time. So we're just going to use the formula for this without going over the details of where it comes from. All right. So let's see an example of this. So let's draw our favorite polar curve, the, the cardioid again. So one plus cosine of theta. So this one starts at two, comes into one, goes to zero there, and then does the same thing the other way. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to find out how long the cardioid is in one revolution, or like you can imagine the circumference of a cardioid, if that, if that word applies to a cardioid. So what we do is we need to know r, and we have that, and we also need to know dr d theta. So we do a derivative here, and the derivative of this will be negative sine of theta because the derivative of one is zero. Now we're going to use our integral. Now what I'm going to do is once again, I'm going to use symmetry. And the symmetry is very helpful when we're doing problems. So if I find twice the length of the top half, it's pretty clear by symmetry that uh, that will be the length of the whole curve because the bottom half is exactly the same length as the top. So I'll have two times the integral from zero to pi, giving me the whole top half, of the square root of r squared plus one plus cosine of theta squared, and then I have plus dr d theta squared. So when I square this, this negative sign becomes positive, and I have a plus sine squared of theta. All right, that's a little bit congested. I'm gonna write this out again, but this time I'm gonna foil the one plus cosine of theta. So I have L is twice the integral from zero to pi of the square root. Now one plus cosine of theta squared is one plus two cosine of theta plus cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta. theta. Now whenever we have these arc length integrals, and by the way, the same, the same reasoning applies for uh, the parametric ones. Typically these integrals start out really nasty looking. And if we foil them out, they end up even looking worse temporarily. But typically when we foil it all out, there's usually something we can do to either cancel something out or simplify something to make the integral not as bad as it was before. And this is going to be no exception. So we see here we have cosine squared plus sine squared. Well, we all know that's going to be just a fancy way of writing one. So that's one. And I'm going to combine it with this other one that we have. What will we get then? We'll have our length is two times the integral zero to pi of the square root of two plus two cosine of theta d theta. Now this integral might actually look familiar. Uh, we actually did this same integral when we were working with uh, parametric equations before. Uh, but this integral had a special trick to it. What we needed to do was we needed to use the half angle formula. But usually with the half angle formula, we start with a trig function being squared and then go to something like this. But in this case, we're actually going to go the other way. So normally, the half angle formula for cosine is 1 half plus 1 half cosine of theta is cosine squared of theta over 2. And this might be written a little bit differently than you're used to. Usually, we have a theta here and a 2 theta there. But as long as whatever this angle is is twice that one, you could write it however you want. So it's okay there's a theta here and a theta over two. Now this is actually almost exactly what we have right there, except it has the wrong numbers in front. We want there to be a two in front. So I'm gonna multiply everything by four. We have two plus two cosine of theta 
is 4 cosine squared of theta over 2. So what we could do is we could replace the thing we have inside the integral with this uh, square. And that's really nice because it will cancel out with the square root. All right, so now with that aside, we're going to continue this equation here. So we have 2 times the integral 0 to pi of the square root of 4 cosine squared theta over 2d theta. Now, it's easy to kind of just think like, okay, well, the square root of something squared, that's just whatever uh, the original thing was that's being squared. Uh, but in this case, we need to be careful. So the square root of something squared is actually the absolute value of the thing that's being squared. So this is really 2 times the integral from 0 to pi of absolute value of 2 cosine of theta over 2 d theta. Now, I might be like, okay, well, I guess there's absolute values there, but that, those never really matter. Uh, well, that's not necessarily true. We need to check to make sure that this cosine isn't really, isn't ever going to be negative in this interval. So the lowest angle we have is zero. We put that in here, we have cosine of zero is one. So that's, that's positive, that's okay. And then the furthest out we go is pi. If I plug cosine of pi in here, it's really cosine of pi over two, which is zero. And all the angles in between would make cosine be somewhere between a zero and one. So in this case, we happen to not have to worry about um, the absolute values. Now, if I decided to not use symmetry in this problem and I was going zero to two pi, then I would need to worry about those absolute values because it definitely would be negative for part of the integral. All right, so now we have this integral. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna integrate here. Um, if I integrate cosine against sine, then I divide by this coefficient. So I divide by one half, AKA I multiply by two. So I have two times two times the two I'm gonna get from there ends up being eight, and then I have sine of theta over two from zero to pi. All right, and now, now we can plug in our numbers here. So I have eight times sine of pi over two, and sine of pi over two is one, and I have sine of zero, which is zero. So I end up with eight as the arc length of this cardioid. So if we go all the way around the cardioid, that would be a length of eight. So the moral of the story is use symmetry when you can. Uh, watch out for absolute values when your function might be negative and draw the picture before you get started. That will let you know uh, what you need to do for this. All right. Well, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask and uh, I'll be happy to help you out.